ever wondered if there was a correlation between law and religion, um, seeing the both of them being two different concepts? But um, do you ever wonder if there is a correlation between law and religion? Then this video is for you. Stay tuned and I'm going to get into it. My name is Michael Long and this is my YouTube channel. I am mostly discuss about law, um, the elementary part of them to help students um, complement their class experience with um, you know discussion, right? So I'm going to be talking about law and religion. If there is any point of synchrony between both of them, if there's any point that they do not agree with themselves, and in case of clash what could be done or what has been you know prepared to be done so um the law in itself you know has been you know concluded by many jurists that no lawyer will be able to give a perfect definition of what the law is but we all know what the law is um the commander guides us that tells us what to do what to restrain from doing and all of what is codified in all our laws our causal caps and of course even the gun norm in Nigeria. So, um, then what is religion on the other hand? Um, many people also have defined religion, Manuel Kant, Swidler, many of them, you know, Martinio, defined what religion is. But for the purpose of this discussion, we know that religion is a belief in and is a supernatural God and having a form of worship with that supernatural being. You know, communication with that supernatural being. So, two major concepts there. One, belief in a supernatural being, and two, having a mode of worship with that supernatural being. Um, it was Harriet Martinu that went ahead to say, they believe in an ever living God. You know, that is an ever living mind that rules the world and connects mankind through moral relations according to um, Arendt Martinio. So many people have given their own definition of what religion is. So we don't have to delve into what religion is more than even where we've got to. Regardless of all these beautiful things then, we must also then understand that some people even do not believe in the existence of any religion and that's fine. Many of them, are, some people are atheists, they don't believe that any religion you know, has to do with them, they don't think that they have to be believe be, belong to any religion that's all right even by even the question of the federal republic of nigeria you can choose not to belong to any religion it's the free choice um section 38 of the constitution speaks about having the freedom of religion so um we must also factor that if we think about the correlation between law and religion what about people do, do that who don't believe in the existence of religion saying this are there any points? Do we have any nexus between law and religion? Um, by the exposition we are going to make, we will have to come to a conclusion where, where, where if we are going to be determined if um, there's a connection between law and religion or not so. So, from time immemorial, if we date back to like you know the 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 15th century. If you check, the canon and Roman laws were the ones that were involved. In fact, um, by history, Roman leaders and canon lawyers were in charge of states. That is to say, he was the one in charge of many of the affairs of those periods. And that being said, that shows that, you know, religion has had influence on, you know, law for quite a good number of time. And that was what was, you know, was could be seen then back then the medieval europe between 500 to 1400 500 ce um majorly the ecclesiastical court even used religious law to determine civil and criminal cases they used sections of the book that punished crimes for criminal matters they sorted matters that were civil with you know religious law that showed to which extent you know religion had got that type of influence on on law it's been like that for a good number of times so let's talk about if before the advent of colonialism to nigeria 
what was obtained before then. In Nigeria, before the colonialists came, even our forebearers, who were people who did many Aboriginal religions, the Alpha Oracles and all of those oracles, by history, even many of them were involved in the issue of leadership and governance. A good number of them were the one who crowned kings, who established markets and all of those things. So that also showed again the level of influence they wield over our religion. Importantly because also those times the form major form of um, economic power, the form major form of you know economy generating revenue um, came from agriculture. And many of all those people were in front of full blown agriculture. In fact how you knew you were very well influential and powerful was apart from your large family was how much agricultural produce you have how much agricultural you know harvest you make so that gave a sort of economic power to even those people also because many of those people who we have said were believers in the you know native religions believe that only when the gods are happy with you is when you have a bounty harvest so the correlation between agriculture and the religion of this period was very close. It was only when the gods were happy with you that you had that bounty harvest, which in turn gives you economic power. Right? So they could not divorce those people and the economic and leadership of those periods. This were what they did, and this even showed how long and um, religion has been having influence on um, on law. If you check, even those times, the established market, they were the one who settled dispute between communities and um, and people. If you check, even the kings of those people will not make all those decisions without consulting some of all these priests, some of all some of all this, you know, all of our fathers who were who were very very known in their religion. So even before the advent of colonialists. We have had a good influence of religion on the law. So let us go back to say, okay, what if, what do we, what if we consider um, after the advent of colonialism? After the advent of colonialism, um, even the law has seen a good level of influence from religion. For example, the criminal code that works in the southern part of the country was modeled over after the one in Queensland, Australia. That was also from a Christianity point of view. Even common law in its evolution came largely. Many of what happened during common law period and even the doctrine of equity were after the Anglican, the Christian, you know, faith in England. You know, that shows us again what level of influence the religion has on the law. Going further, the Muslim penal code, which is operational in the northern part of the country, was modeled after the Sudanese law, the Sudanese code, you know, that is also following the, you know, the Muslim religion. It shows us to what extent, what our religion has power over the law, our as connection with the law. Going further than that, the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria has then said that all of us have, you know, the right to choose our religion without being coerced you know into that religion going further by section 39 to say you even have that power to express your your religious views anywhere provided that that place is not designated to be a place where religious activities should not happen passive for example in a business environment it is strictly for business and you know it's not supposed to be where you're going to be doing religious stuff so let us restrict religious stuff to religious environment but generally in the scheme of things you could express your religious views, you know, as you deem fit. And then, if you go by the section 40, you will have the right to assembly. You could assemble and, you know, have your religious activities where you want to have them. And this is what the Gundam says about, um, about even having your religion. Of course, um, you cannot coerce anyone to choosing your religion. Um, of course, that's an, that's an exception for parents. Of who are parent local uh, local parents over the children or guardian, but by the time the children are, are kids, they you know can take the religion of their parents or people who have local parents over them, 
provided they are still children. The moment they stop being children, they cannot go ahead and be take their own religion. And they cannot because into doing the religion that their parents have, you know, bequeathed to them. So this also goes ahead to show us the level of freedom, the level of free will that the the Constitutional Federal Republic of Nigeria has amended has given to um, us even in a practice of religion. So the question again is, when there is a conflict between law and religion, which of them supersedes? Um, knowing fully well again that some people do not believe in the existence of any religion. It's clear, many, many scholars have spoken about this, you know, one of the focal beautiful points of a particular scholar is, is that when the particular religious practice is essential to religion, the law should be made to relax if it is essential. So, for example, using of emblem, you know, we don't know where emblems is as sacramental, our, our scarves, hijabs for the Muslims, all our tags for the Christians, our pinafores for some sect of the Pentecostals. Um, how essential is it to the practice of that religion? If it is not essential, the law should be revived and the adherent should be made to bend. But if it is essential, then the law has to relax for the purpose of that particular um, the particular um, religious practice in tolerance of ourselves in tolerance of ourselves because importantly the world has gone to and to a point where a lot of discussion has been happening about religious tolerance we there's no way we're going to speak about law and the involvement has in religion without talking about religious tolerance because over the years things have changed for example in the yesterday years assembly grounds were mostly christian songs mostly christian songs now because of the development that happened there were days for there are now days for christians there are days for muslims when we say that in future there may be days for even native religions where they're going to have their own days to coordinate their own service in their own particular way this is understanding you know what what type of religion exists and how we have to tolerate than ourselves. In sometimes back in the British Army, the Sikhs, whereas um, there is a direction that the, Christ, the, the Sikh men has to even use turban in their hair, it caused a lot of issues between the British Army, whereas they used their blue beret instead of any turban. But after many deliberations and debates, you know, it, it was bent to say, okay, then you can use your blue turban. And if you check to the Sikhs, make for about 0.88 of the British Army, that's like 520,000 um, in the British Army. And that changed nothing, it could not die, and you know, things continued. This showed the type of, you know, thing that existed between, um, between, you know, the, the, the law and religion. Then, there are points of convergence as much as there are points of division. There are points of convergence, there's a point of separation. The law has a paternalistic role, whereas if there is about to be a commission of a crime because of your religious practice, the law revives itself to attack it, to forestall it, to never allow it happen, and to punish it if it ever happens. You know, let's take some individual practices of some religion into cognizance. The Catholic, for example, do not allow for abortion for contraceptives and pills. Nigerian government, through the laws, do not also accept abortion. But there are circumstances where medically, a woman has to be, you know, her pregnancy has to be terminated so as to save her life. If the person, for example, is an adherent of the Catholic faith, you know, that sense she would be restricted. But the law has to come and, you know, play a role there because Somebody's life is tampered with. Somebody's life is about to be taken away because of a particular Christian faith, a particular religious faith. It may not be Christian this time around. Same goes for um, the Jehovah's Witness, for example, that do not allow for transfusion. And maybe somebody is anemic and needs blood for stability to be revived. 
Because of the faith, and said, oh, we don't do this. The law can be called to that occasion. And it has happened before. In the case of medical and dental practitioner disciplinary tribunal versus Okonkwo, whereas um, the person had taken an undertaking that they should not give him blood, her blood, regardless of whatever happened, the family brought action. You know, and the doctor said, oh, I have to respect our wishes and all and all and all. But you know, the family argued back and forth to say, where you were bringing her from, you knew this was the reason why they referred her to you, so you don't have any plan. How come you, you did this? Well, the Supreme Court ruled in that particular case. The case was when the health of a person is involved, the mm -hmm. one has to be protected. The law has to work in that sense to avoid losing such person. In furtherance, if, for example, a child is uh, needing blood, a child cannot be refused transfusion. We know that a child may not be able to make decisions by itself, but the parents of the child may not, cannot make decisions on behalf of the child to refuse transfusion. So in any circumstances, a child would always take transfusion. If he's 18 and 21, he can determine, say, well, I'm not going to take it, I don't want to take blood transfusion, let anything that will happen up, you know. But importantly, the law comes and revives itself when the welfare of a child is involved. There are many cases to this event. There's an English case of Kaita, I will put the, the, the case on your screen. Um, there's also the case of Esabuna uh, versus Fawaya, where the family is a religious um, Jehovah's family and they gave birth to a child in a lucky facility and afterwards they found that the child was an kidney blood. The doctor, you know, opened up this to the payment but they said, no, no, we don't do this, we don't do this here. And the, the state had to take it over and sued and, and gave a fear so that they could administer the transition. They did that and the family brought a claim against the hospital, the commissioner of police, the magistrate court for that ruling, you know. And it was held again that in that type of cases where religious practice, individual practice is tampering with the person's life, the law has to be revived to forestall that situation. This shows again the differences between the law and religion. The place where they are cold and hot water never come in closeness. Do you understand? The place where they, 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 they don't come. There's a conflict. They don't allow. It is clear. The law has to supersede at that point because of you know of what it is. These are some of the areas where law and religion maintains a distance, keeps themselves at bay. Where we have seen areas where they have rubbed off on themselves. We have also seen areas where uh, the law has to come in place. Let's give two more examples. I'm going to call the rap. For example, in the in the movie that came out recently, the Osman, the King's Osman. What happened with the King's Osman was the law applied to avoid an a very old barbaric system. The Osman had to kill himself to, so to speak, see the king off to the afterlife. But the authority got the window of it and they tried to forestall it. We knew what happened there, but what happened there exactly is what the law would do. He was locked in prison, not allowed to take his life and all. This is what the law would do. If we go ahead, there are some points where the law again, like I said earlier, has tried to reason along with persons. And I'm going to use that also uh, to validate the point of the scholar that said, if the practice is essential, the law can be relaxed. Otherwise, the adherent must be made to bend. The, recently, the case of Amas Afridals in the Langria Law School of wearing a job to take call to bar. I mean, wearing a job doesn't change anything. Even the week itself is a veil, it's a covering. So, going back, forth, back and forth, back and forth. The law bends to say, well, you can put on your job. It has never happened before. We happened this time around. So, you don't try to reason alongside things that are not life-threatening so to speak if the essential practice of a religion is not life-threatening the law can bend if it is life-threatening the law must uh, must play its paternalistic role 
So in that sense, two things. If the essential practice is life-threatening, um, the law must act. If it is not life-threatening or consequential, the law may bend. Otherwise, the adherence of that particular religion must bend. My lecturer made mention of a Catholic um, nun who um, wore veils as their own practice when we were going to do a call to Bashi, to remove all the veils for a day. And nothing happened. She was not excommunicated. Nobody died. This was because, you know, the Lord tried to release it alongside the just like the case of Amos Um You know, she had to bend. You know, in this case of Amos without the law had to bend. So it's back and forth. It's back and forth most of the time. But importantly, when it is life threatening, the law never bends because the law has a paternalistic role to play. Secondly, when a child welfare is involved, the law has to play its role because the parent cannot reject on behalf of a child blood transfusion and all of those life life determining things. So that is um, little about law and and um, religion, the convergence the differences and so on and so forth. Thank you very much for watching my video today. If you like this video, if it has helped you in at least one way, do me a favor by liking it. I'm going to be doing subsequent videos on law uh, and law related matters to help you complement your class studies and um, your class activities. Thank you very much for watching me today. I'm so grateful.